Uh, welcome to today's webinar. My name is Maxwell Okello. I'm the Chief Executive of the American Chamber of Commerce and your moderator for this morning's session. Um, as per the norm, um, our, your audio and video will be muted or turned off during the session. Um, I'll have uh, some brief introductory remarks, set the stage, and then we'll get into a panel discussion with our panelists whom I'll be introducing shortly, and we'll try and keep this morning's webinar to within an hour. So welcome again, and uh, just want to remind everybody that as we move along, if you have any questions, please type them in the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen, your Zoom screen, the Q&A tab. Um, I just want to emphasize that the Q&A tab and not the chat tab, so that it's easier for us to track as panelists track the questions that you have. So we'll, we'll jump right into it. Um, so today's session is on the digital economy. And uh, this is the second of a series of uh, digital transformation webinars that we've been holding at Amcham. If you remember, the first one was on the future of work, where we basically tried to give a prognosis of um, you know, the changes occasioned by uh, COVID um, around the future of work, the remote working and uh, the gig economy and so on and so forth. So this morning, we'll be looking broadly at the digital economy um, on the back of the metamorphosis that we've seen that has been occasioned by uh, this pandemic. And so um, it is clear that, um, you know, the acceleration towards the digital economy has actually happened. And uh, the fact that, you know, digital technologies have become the norm, uh, have been adopted, are critical towards us coping with the negative effects of COVID-19. In Kenya, the digital economy is estimated at five to six trillion Kenya shillings if we take an estimate of the proportion of the country's GDP that is transacted through mobile money. Kenya has also seen its ICT sector grow at an average of 10.8 percentage points annually since 2016, becoming a significant source of economic development and job creation with spillover effects in almost every sector of our economy. Now, different types of digital services such as e-commerce, e-payment uh, systems are growing with consumers and businesses across the board, quickly adapting and adopting the use of these platforms. Indeed, um, this webinar is made possible by such a platform. So digitally agile firms are adapting successfully, while trans traditional businesses may have to re-engineer their business models to this new reality. Now, I'm sure there are several questions that we've been asking ourselves throughout uh, this time. And then some of the questions that we'll be looking at and are hoping to address in this morning's webinar include, um, you know, whether or not this is the defining moment when it comes to the digital economy, both locally and, and globally. Um, there's been quite a bit of activity around the e-commerce space, um, driven a lot by um, the fact that, you know, we are social distancing, um, you know, working remotely, um, work still has to go on, commerce has to trans transact. And so um, could this be the point at which, um, you know, we've tipped into the future that for a lot of us uh, was a long way coming, but is now squarely with us. Um, and some of the other questions that we could also address during this uh, forum is, you know, the impact on business largely and, and economies um, as we start looking at reopening uh, our economy. So to take us through this discussion, we have a really great panel today. Um, I'll start off by introducing uh, Engineer Obama, whom you must be familiar with, those who've attended our webinars before. Um, he's back with us again, representing uh, the Ministry of ICT, the PS the Ministry of ICT. Engineer Obam is the CEO of the National Communications Secretariat, which is a statutory ICT policy advisor to government of Kenya uh, at the Ministry of ICT and Youth Affairs. Engineer Obam is an expert in ICT policy regulatory and operational aspects of ICTs, especially in telecommunications, broadcasting and spectrum management. And I'm sure when he gets to um, his submissions, he will talk a little more about uh, himself and the work that they do. We're also joined by Peter Njonjo, who is the co-founder and CEO of uh, Twiga Foods, an award-winning company 
that aggregates informal retail demand and organizes an efficient supply chain for fresh and dry goods through a technology-enabled E2B platform. Uh, prior to um, you know, taking up this current role, Peter worked or spent 21 years at Coca-Cola Company, uh, with his last role being the president of Coca-Cola West and Central Africa Business Unit. And Peter also happens to be a, a previous uh, board president of Amcham Kenya. We also have with us Kennedy Luhombo, who's a senior business development leader uh, in charge of merchant sales and acquisition at Visa East Africa, where he's responsible for acquiring business relationships and ensuring the growth of visa acceptance in merchants' locations in 13 countries falling under East Africa. Kennedy is a digital payments enthusiast who believes that payments need to keep pace with consumer convenience and embrace an enablement of transaction in, in, initiation from any gadget. And last, and finally, and, and certainly not least, we have with us Rose Mosero, who's a, who's a policy regulatory and legal advisor to the cabinet secretary ministry of ICT and innovation. She's also a very experienced legal practitioner with a demonstrated history of working in the tech industry. So very briefly, um, those are our panelists today and they'll have an opportunity to introduce themselves properly um, as we get into the discussion. So I want us to, um, you know, dive right in and uh, welcome, welcome to the panel. Thank you for sharing your time with us this morning. I want to get this show on the road. Um, and I'll start off with Engineer Obama. Kenya came up with uh, its digital economy blueprint um, earlier this year. And the work I'm sure was done uh, over, over a couple of months, but it was launched sometime early this year, um, which presents a framework to improve Kenya's and indeed Africa's ability to leap for economic growth. I'd like you to share with us some highlights from the blueprint. What are some of the challenges that you may also foresee in the implementation of the blueprint? And as you answer this, feel free to talk to us a little about uh, the work of the National Secretariat um, that you lead and, and how that plays into um, the work that the Ministry of ICT does and how you see the digital economy then being part of that economic transformation that we're talking about. Engineer Ban. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Maxwell. And, um, Thank you all for being here. I'm, I'm glad to be back. Thank you for having me back. I hope I'll meet your expectations. Um, when we came up with the blueprint, uh, one of the things that we noticed, we, we are told is that the, the digital economy globally is growing at between 16 and 20 percent. While actually the, uh, the other economy, if you get a 5 percent growth, then that is considered very good or 8 percent. You know, the top countries grow at 8 percent. So obviously the, the, the growth in uh, economic uh, transformation lies in the digital economy. Um, talking about the blueprint, uh, the, um, Kenya is a member of a group of countries, 35 countries called the Smart Africa Alliance. And that alliance, they are, their principle is to have a single digital market for Africa. Uh, Africa is a single digital market as per the Africa continental free trade area. Uh, agreement which was signed by all the heads of state of, of Africa and I think last day it was endorsed. So Kenya was asked to share its experience in the digital transformation of its economy. So we, uh, the government uh, together with stakeholders, some who are actually on this call, uh, met and uh, shared the experiences and came up with uh, what we considered were the key drivers of the digital transformation of our economy. And after many debates, we settled on uh, uh, five pillars which we think are the key in driving digital transformation. Uh, the first one was the digital government. And digital government basically addresses the issue of improving access, uh, quality, transparency, equity, efficiency, and effectiveness of delivery of government services. And so this uh, looks at uh, adopting and implementing uh, government uh, services that can generate re more revenue for government, reduce waste, improve services, and increase citizen participation in a transparent and trusted environment. Incidentally, this pillar also rhymes with the, one of the key focus areas of our national ICT policy, which talks about public service delivery. The second pillar of the digital economy blueprint is digital business. 
Uh, and within this digital business, uh, this pillar, there were three focus areas, digital trade, you know, when you're introducing one of our panelists, uh, talk about digital financial services and digital content. Uh, we are looking at with the digital business, an integrated way of trading goods, information, goods services, including labor, having affordable, resilient, open and efficient uh, platforms and payment systems, uh, having uh, legal frameworks to enforce contracts, resolve disputes and protect consumers. And of course, develop regional markets where our goods cannot not only sell in Kenya, but sell maybe in the region and uh, across the, the continent. The third pillar is the infrastructure pillar. And in infrastructure, we are not just looking at digital infrastructure in the blueprint. We look at the usual broadband infrastructure, but there are some key infrastructure that are important to, to, to digital economy. Things like energy. If you don't have uh, 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 reliable energy, then these platforms that drive digital business and digital government will not function. So energy, uh, electricity is a key infrastructure. In uh, e-commerce, and as we've seen during the COVID-19, delivery of goods that have been purchased is important. You know, in Kenya, the way we describe a house is you say the house with the red roof with a black gate when you go down the hill and with a big tree. So if the tree is cut and the stones are used to build another house with the red roof, how will you get it? So one of the pieces of infrastructure that we are looking at is what we are calling the national addressing system. So energy um, platforms, which are infrastructure plus addressing together with broadband infrastructure are key, uh, one of the key pillars that we've identified in the digital transformation of the economy. The fourth one is what we are calling innovation driven entrepreneurship. And this uh, is anchored on um, what we are calling an accessible, inclusive and collaborative uh, system that supports uh, entrepreneurs at all levels and will encourage investments. I think uh, Trigger Foods is a, is a good example of this and integrates R&D uh, through partnerships. And um, some of the characteristics we identify in the blueprint are uh, businesses using new uh, digital technologies, uh, uh, using uh, you know, social platform, mobile analytics, cloud solutions, uh, and all the new you know uh, new technologies we talk about. Um, the last pillar, uh, which we are calling digital skills and values, and I know my colleague Rose will be talking about this. We identified uh, with all these uh, pillars, you need skills that you need people with skills to drive this. These are skills that we say, uh, the buzzword, you, you, you need skills for the 21st, 21st century that are required for the fourth industrial revolution. That's why we, we think skills are a very important aspect of digital transformation. And the values aspect is, uh, is derived from the fact that we want people with skills, but have values so that if they're transacting online, they have the same values as if it was a face-to-face -face, so that what you order is what you get and people you, people are, are honest and transparent dealing with you the, the one that now cap, uh, sort of encapsulates all these pillars is what we are calling cross-cutting issues and these are the uh, policy legal and regulatory frameworks that ensure that digital government works, digital business works infrastructure is rolled out we have innovation we encourage innovation and entrepreneurship and, uh, and, 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 and of course, uh, we have the, the, the relevant curriculum for the digital skills. Maybe let me stop there because I've talked uh, a lot more. And um, in terms of introduction, I think you adequately introduced me. Uh, we, we, uh, we provide advice to the ministry. Basically what we do, we, we draft policies, some of the bills that eventually transform into laws and uh, some of the strategies. For example, we led the effort in developing the digital economy blueprint and now we are leading an effort to develop the digital economy strategy out of that blueprint. Uh, you talked about one of my areas of speciality is uh, spectrum. We are also now trying to develop a national uh, spectrum policy that will try and uh, uh, enhance the availability of spectrum to mobile operators and others to drive the next phase of uh, mobile technologies like 5G and others. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, Engineer Obama. What, what are some of the challenges that you, you, you see in implementing this? If you could just highlight one or two. One, I think, will be the resources required. Because um, if, if you look at uh, connectivity, uh, broadband connectivity, uh, we, we, we don't have, uh, uh, you know, not everybody is connected. Even during this pandemic, 
you find that only a few uh, students, for example, are able to connect online. So to actually connect everybody in the Republic of Kenya will take a huge, huge, uh, huge amount of resource. The Communication Authority has done um, a, 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 what they call an, an access gap study, and the figure runs into hundreds of billions. So that's one. In terms of, say, digital business, uh, we need to integrate all the payment platforms. For example, taking the example of mobile phones, they are all different wallets. So uh, we, one of the things we need to do is have an integrated payment system to drive digital business. In terms of government, although the e-citizen platform is very good, but it only captures a few government services. So we still need to digitize all government services and put them online and then develop applications that ensure that every Kenyan can uh, get access to these services everywhere, uh, wherever they are at, what, uh, at what, what, uh, whatever time. Lastly, I, I think one of the big challenges, we have the issue of inclusion, and I'm talking about inclusion of women, youth, and people, uh, uh, vulnerable people, and those who are underserved. So we would have to look at each of those pillars and see where we can include, uh, uh, try and bring every, every Kenyan on board. Okay, fantastic. Thank you. Thank you, Engineer Bam. Let, let me bring in uh, Peter Njonjo into the conversation. And, and Peter, um, you know, the digital transformation of various sectors and markets can foster production of high quality goods and services at reduced cost. Um, we know that digitization is also transforming value chains um, in different ways and opening up new channels uh, for value addition and broader structural change. Trigger Foods is seen as a, as a disruptor in the agriculture value chain. Um, what's, what's the journey been like for you and, and uh, how do you see um, technology? What role do you see technology playing in that? And so what are some of the key highlights or insights that you can share uh, from your perspective? No, thank you so much, uh, Maxwell. I think, um, I think it's always easier to uh, start by describing the problem that we're trying to solve because uh, we at times uh, get into the whole space around uh, uh, technology, but technology is not an end in itself. It's a means to, uh, to an end. And for us, uh, the main problem starts with uh, the amount of money that Kenyans are spending on food. Um, you know, last time uh, I looked at the World Bank data, that was about 55% of disposable income going to food. That means that, you know, there's uh, wealthier Kenyans who are maybe spending about 5% on food, but then there's a bulk who are spending maybe 70, 75% on food. If you're spending 75% of your disposable income on food, essentially struggling to survive. And the main challenge uh, with this is that uh, the way food is produced in the country is all informal. And the way food is sold in the country is also informal. So when you have two large segments that are informal, then the supply chain then tends to be uh, very, very suboptimized. And that's essentially the challenge that we're facing in Kenya. So where you're finding that, for example, uh, 30 to 40 percent of the food that we produce gets lost before it even makes its way to the retailer. So when you look at it, then what role does technology have to play in this? Now, the thing is that unless the farmer knows where they're selling the product, they will not invest uh, in uh, large scale production. So, so the first thing that we then looked at was how do we then aggregate informal retail? Because if you think about Nairobi to be maybe about 6 million people, give and take, when you think about the larger Nairobi, I'm talking about Athiriva, Kitengela, uh, Machakos, uh, going all the way to maybe uh, Thika, Kiambu, thinking about that whole metropolis, because essentially we're interconnected somewhat. And if you think about that whole uh, area, 6 million people served by 180,000 retailers. So if I'm a farmer and I decide to invest in uh, 100 acres of land, who am I selling to? So, and that's been the main challenge. So what we're doing now is that we're leveraging technology to aggregate the demand that sits in the informal retail. And once you do that, when you have start aggregating all those dukas and kiosks and mamambogas, then it gives you access uh, to actually start building a platform that you can integrate the farming side. Now we are seeing farmers who are investing um, uh, in uh, pieces of land, you know, 100 acres, 200 acres, 500 acres, and supplying exclusively to Twigger. These are things that we're not able to do some time back. And that's a transformation that we're seeing through, uh, uh, through technology. And to an extent that now we actually commissioned our first farm with um, our first IoT devices, where essentially on the farm, we're able to remotely start telling the amount of uh, moisture, humidity, wind, and all that allows us to start maximizing yield. So the way I would look at it is, 
we're actually solving this problem around food. And the whole idea is how can we bring down the cost of food? Because if we move the cost of food from 55% of disposable income, maybe to, 10, uh, maybe to even uh, 40%, that's 15% of disposable income injected back into the economy. People are able to buy cars, they're able to invest in uh, houses, uh, entertainment. Essentially, it starts sparring the economy. And just to give you some context, the United States was spending 52% of their disposable income in the 1870s after the Civil War. So if you look at, uh, and if you look at the US today, they're spending about 10%. So, and if you think about it, that's what's freed up a lot of resources in economies like those to really start sparring other sectors. And I think that's a role that technology can play here because we don't need to wait for another 150 years. I think we can leverage technology to, uh, to, to, uh, to uh, get to scale um, some of the solutions that we're looking at. And for us as a company, getting to uh, where we are, um, as I mentioned uh, in many instances, you know, it's, it's tough uh, building a business. Um, in, uh, in Africa sometimes, because the key thing is that you have to do two things. What you find is that maybe in the West, you know, a lot of companies already have the infrastructure in place. So all they have to do is invest in the intellectual property and then uh, they have a business. What you find is that, you know, in some of the instances uh, on the continent, the ecosystem is not very, very supportive. So you have to create a supportive environment for your business and then build the intellectual property to solve the problem that you're solving. And it makes starting a business much, much harder um, in this uh, part of the world. So at least uh, we've been able to overcome some of these challenges to get to where we are. And I think one of my key, key objectives, uh, working for example in the, in the committee that uh, uh, CS uh, Joe Musheru uh, appointed me to the, the COVID ICT committee, the whole idea is how can we create an ecosystem that becomes more supportive for other companies like ourselves who may not have access to capital and help them uh, realize uh, their vision and solving some of the social problems that we have in the country. Excellent. Well, that's, that's really great to hear. And, and you know, that's, that's a very interesting statistic that you shared, um, you know, 55% of our disposable income going to food. Um, it's, it's quite significant if you ask me. I, I've not looked at it that way. Um, let, let me bring in Kennedy into the conversation. Um, so Kennedy, from a digital or a cashless payment systems uh, perspective, we know that this is a, a key enabler. I mean, businesses such as uh, Twiga would not work without uh, that aspect being sorted out. Um, These uh, digital payment uh, systems allow people to access goods and services wherever they are, whenever they want. As we've experienced, um, I believe during this uh, period, um, you know, most of us are now ordering things online. Uh, you make payments. In fact, you're encouraged not to, um, you know, transact in cash. So I think the relevance of digital uh, payments and, and cashless payments is, uh, cannot be gainsaid. So from your perspective, Kennedy, what, what are the ways in which digital payments can actually support um, economic growth? Um, thank you, Max. So, um, so first, um, I, yeah, you... you um, your introduction, I think, covered everything, so I don't need to go through that. But I would like to very quickly um, just highlight uh, the organization that I work for, uh, uh, which is Visa. Visa is the largest payment network um, uh, globally with about 61 million businesses uh, using our services in over 200 countries and territories, um, over 3.4 billion of uh, payment accounts that we enable on our network through our 15,000 plus uh, financial institutions. Um, the mission uh, of Visa, um, or, or rather what connects us is the fact that we are focused on making sure that we are connecting the world um, through the most innovative, reliable and secure payment network. And, and, and that does actually tie into the question that you just asked, because our role in digital payments is fueled uh, by that strong belief that digital payments and economic growth are very closely interlinked. Um, I would like to highlight a couple of uh, things that may uh, probably um, speak to um, the, the importance of digital payments and um, 
uh, in, in economic growth of any uh, economy. Uh, first is um, increasing citizen access to affordable financial tools. And, and that cannot be overstated. Um, today, it sounds like a cliche when we talk about the importance of access to financial tools, but it is indeed um, uh, a very direct link. There is a very direct link between um, financial access and economic growth of any uh, economy. Second, um, the financial independence of um, our vulnerable um, in the society, especially uh, women, connecting them with financial, um, uh, with the financial mainstream is extremely important. Um, and as we uh, advance our solutions, one of the key agendas of Visa is to make sure that we are making it as accessible as possible for those vulnerable uh, communities or you know, those who have been historically disadvantaged when it comes to uh, access to financial services. Then the third one is benefits that uh, um, go well beyond you know, uh, just uh, convenience. When we talk about payment solutions, we're not just talking about uh, making it convenient for the consumer. We're also talking about lowering costs we are talking about increasing security, which are factors that do contribute to, um, uh, to the growth of any economy. Um, and then for governments especially, uh, and especially for regulators, uh, more comprehensive oversight and monitoring uh, can inform, uh, for example, central banks' uh, policies uh, and economic policies. Uh, if you have, uh, and this is proven the world over there, you know, data is, is actually the new currency today. If you have access to data, if, and, and that data is being facilitated by digitization of, uh, uh, of transactions, movement of goods and services, then um, a central bank uh, or a regulator can very easily uh, tie their economic policies to the levers that uh, push economic growth. Uh, finally, um, of course, access to credit. Uh, we know how our financial systems work. Um, they emphasize a lot on uh, payment history, credit history, et cetera. So if you're digitizing payment, digitization in the, in the, very, in the, in the very essence of it um, means that you're bringing the unbanked or underbanked into the uh, uh, formal financial system. And as you do that, you are enabling people to uh, build the history that they need for them to be able to access uh, uh, credit uh, uh, facilities across and be able to uh, build themselves. Great. Yeah, great. Thank, thanks a lot for that, uh, Kennedy. Uh, let me bring back uh, Engineer and, and, uh, and Rose into, into, into this conversation. Um, you know, the, 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 that aspect, just taking, picking off from where uh, Kennedy has left, the aspect of uh, the digital economy and its potential to really support economic development. Um, from different perspectives, there's a sense that, you know, any value realized in the digital economy is unlikely to be equitably uh, distributed. For example, um, those with limited digital skills that you talked about, uh, engineer, at the beginning, um, as one of the challenges, um, may find themselves at a, at a disadvantage when it comes to, um, you know, really getting or taking advantage of the digital economy uh, compared to their better equipped uh, compatriots, um, you know, within the, the same ecosystem. Local companies, on the other hand, may find that uh, they lose out to better placed, um, you know, multinationals or foreign players um, who, you know, have or coming from a much more advanced uh, economy in that sense. Um, have better technology that they can leverage and so on. What's, what's your view, what's your overall view on this or your broad view on this? And uh, what are some potential uh, policy responses um, that government might be looking into to sort of try and, uh, you know, even out the playing field, so to speak? Uh, thank you, uh, Maxwell. Uh, I didn't expect you to come back to me so soon, but uh, <laughs> good. Yeah, um, if, again, if you look at the pillars uh, that, that I talked about that are driving the, the digital economy strategy or around which we are developing the strategy, if, 
if if we can uh, digitize all government services and put up infrastructure that any Ke every Kenyan can access these services wherever they are. And uh, one of the focus areas on our national ICT policy is what we are calling mobile first, because 99.99% of our connectivity is through mobile mobile plat mobile platforms. So if if we can make sure that mobile uh, broadband is available across the country, and we digitize our, our government services, it means that regardless of where one is, they can be able to to get these services. Similarly, with infrastructure. Um, but, we, the government has a project where we've, we are rolling out fiber. Uh, now the th third phase of this project actually targeting, taking fiber optic to the sub-county. And then the next stage will be to have the last, what we call the last mile, the access network, which can be rolled out by the, the, uh, you know, pr the mobile operators or, or, or maybe you know, using Wi-Fi or such technologies. Again, uh, by making sure that we take infrastructure, not based on a, on a return, on any returns, but just based on, uh, on public good, we are at least taking infrastructure to the, the public. So we are trying to address the issue of, uh, of uh, equity or inequity in that, in that aspect. Um, uh, if you look at um, digital business, the issue of digital financial services and financial inclusion, and there's a lot of work which is being done by, both by the, the central bank, the, the banks, and, and, and the, uh, the, the, the national treasury, to expand the space for financial inclusion. I think Kenya is a good example of using mobile money in trying to have financial inclusion uh, you know, uh, uh, across the country. The, the, maybe uh, other colleagues will talk more about it, but talking about skills, the way we are looking at the skills issue from, uh, from the, nas the national uh, digital economy strategy is that you have different levels of skills. For example, for my mother who is in the village, who just wants to be able to get M-Pesa, pay for goods at the shop and then the picky, picky guy de delivers it to her home. She maybe just needs skills to use the phone. So we are looking at what we are calling basic skills, intermediate skills and advanced skills. So depending on what you want to do in the digital economy, where we should look at equipping people with the skills that uh, suit their needs so that uh, the skills development will not be uniform across the whole population. That way, at least everybody has a role to play in the digital economy, depending on uh, what service they want to, to use in that space. As quickly, some of the, the things that we've done. I want to talk about the most famous one, Huduma Number. In the digital economy, confidence, confidence that you're dealing with the, the, a, 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 a bona fide person is important. And face to face, I can see this is Maxwell. I, we can exchange cards and you know, that, 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 that's done. But the digital economy where you don't see somebody, maybe they are five countries away, having a digital ID that can be authenticated is very important. And that's why the whole idea be, behind the Huduma number is to have a digital uh, ID for Kenyans so that people can trans, Kenyans can transact online. So that's one uh, effort. I've already talked about the spectrum policy. I think uh, uh, Peter talked about IoT. Uh, so IoT depends on spectrum. So we need to have spectrum available so that we can connect as many things as possible to allow for um, uh, digital transformation of the economy. Um, the most recent one, which already we've talked about on this forum, is uh, data protection. Uh, if people don't feel confident that their information is protected and secured, they will not be willing to transact on digital platforms. So by having this act, uh, in place, at least we are trying to put it, we are trying to assure Kenyans that if, if you go on a digital platform, we have put in place laws and policies that allows you, allows your data to be safe and uh, please be as safe as when you go to a shop and you have to write down your details and you leave it there and you are confident that the shopkeeper or whoever you are transacting with is not going to take that data and use it for something else. Uh, so th those, do, uh, uh, maybe I'll stop there, uh, uh, some of the key things that we're looking at. Of course, the big one is also the digital economy strategy, which we are now uh, finalizing the draft, and then it will be published on the Ministry of ICT website. And again, I would urge, it's an open forum, any, any one of the participants here to when it's published to actually give comments and see how we can improve it. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. and, and uh, Rose, you have, you want to add on to that? You're on mute. 
Yeah. Yep, sure. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Maxwell, for having me. Um, I think what I maybe will focus on um, is just a digital skills aspect. Um, uh, uh, Engineer Obam uh, mentioned this a little, uh, touched on this a little bit. Um, but one of the things that uh, Engineer Obam said, which can't be uh, stated as enough, is the uh, the fact that skills and digital skills specifically um, will be important as we it's been said that whilst we refer to it as a digital economy at current, um, it will be a way of life for the future. And if we want the entire population to be able to um, adequately access and benefit from, um, um, from the digital economy, then we will have to have skills, um, which is why the ministry um, and the government at large has adopted a number of initiatives which are anchored in the national ICT policy, also anchored in um, the medium term plan uh, three, uh, which deals with initiatives um, such as, for example, the JIRA program, um, as well as just uh, general skilling. So you've got the DLP program for, for um, people in, in, in primary schools, um, rolling out to secondary schools and the like. Um, I think it's a very key uh, uh, it objective for the government to ensure that as our youth um, from children up to a point where uh, they get into the jobs market, we have um, people who are skilled for, for the digital economy, whether it's the basic, the intermediate or the advanced skills, um, to be able to then compete globally um, and not only within, not only within the, the confines of, of, of Kenya. Thank you. Okay. All right, great. And, and talking, about, talking about the youth, um, the digital economy is touted as uh, holding the key to unlocking opportunities for the youth in the future. Um, we know that the government has uh, launched a program called AJIRA, um, which um, you know, is, is really an initiative towards en enabling our youth to, to get digital jobs, if, if I'm not wrong. Could you perhaps uh, talk a little about that and, and how it, 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 it intersects with the digital economy? Absolutely. Um, so it's not it's not a surprise to everyone that we have a very youthful population. Um, we've got a median age of 19 uh, in Kenya with an estimated um, number of 1 million youth coming into the job markets annually. Um, the ministry uh, and, and a lot of those are actually absorbed and in, absorbed into the informal sector. Um, only about, uh, I'd say, um, probably 20%, if not less, are absorbed into the, the formal sector. Uh, so the ministry in 2016 observed this trend um, and the move towards an on, uh, sorry, a on-demand sort of um, work system rather than an on-premise work. So looking at outsourcing um, the gig work um, and other digital and digitally enabled jobs that are available for use. Uh, being that I think it, it would be very difficult for us to absorb um, you know, 1 million youth annually um, into nine to five jobs. Um, so we have to think about an innovative way in which we can, we can, we can do that. So to tackle this issue of um, unemployment and underemployment, the JIRIC uh, program came in with a vision to recognize, to have Kenya recognized globally as a freelance hub um, and a very ambitious mission, um, though achievable, to have 1 million Kenyans um, earning a decent wage from digital and digitally enabled jobs annually. Um, so the Jira Digital Program is uh, uh, founded on, on four pillars. So one is awareness, uh, which is effectively building trust, education um, in terms of uh, digital jobs and the fact that they are a fit way for, for, for youth to, to gain employment um, and to earn a decent wage, uh, which then I guess comes into, uh, you know, the Kenyan culture where if you're not a doctor or if you're not a, a business person or you're not a lawyer, you're not going into work nine to five, then is it really um, a job that you have? So changing the mindset, not just of the youth, but of the community at large to see uh, digital and digitally enabled jobs as viable opportunities uh, for, for earning decent wage. Um, then there's a pillar on training and mentorship, which looks at skilling um, and guidance for dynamic and, and ever-changing uh, digital jobs. So this is where we look at um, the basic intermediate and advanced skills, seeing where people fit in um, and ensuring that they've got mentorship uh, to guide them as they go into the digital space and digitally enabled space. And when I talk about digitally enabled jobs, I'm not, um, 
I'm talking about uh, jobs that can be accessed on platforms, but are actually done manually. So you're looking at your, your tradies, so a carpenter who's a Not just you know freelancing work online being giving accounting services online we're looking at a whole uh, or, or uh, being a developer and, and the like we're looking at a whole spectrum um, and then we have the access to infrastructure I think this was touched on um, slightly by by engineer bomb but what we look at is ensuring that our youth have a safe space in which they can they can work um, they can receive training uh, they can uh, have peer-to-peer -peer engagement um, learn from each other and mentor each other um, and what we've done here is uh, with the partnership of um, parliament uh, the uh, we've we've had um, engagements with the with the mem uh, members of parliament um, where we've created uh, what is called as Ijira Youth Empowerment Centers. Um, and effectively, we've got uh, connectivity that serves both the youth that are in those centers and the communities around them. So um, uh, um, I guess a temporary last mile um, connectivity uh, sort of initiative where we have this uh, center is at ward level um, for access to, to, to jobs and they've got devices as well so they can work there um, as well as be trained. Um, and the last but most important pillar is access to dignified jobs. So for us as, as government ensuring that we're creating an enabling environment to ensure um, that private sector is able to generate work for our youth, ensuring that we're reaching out to um, international players, um, also able to, to accommodate uh, our youth and, and, and to, to give them jobs. But most importantly, looking at public sector as a source of jobs. Um, so we're, you know, Engineer Obama talked about digitization and digital government. Um, for us to be able to achieve that, we'll need to digitize our systems, whether it's judiciary, whether it's um, lands, uh, uh, whether it's a civil registry, ensuring that uh, we have uh, you know, all our services available to, to, to citizens online and the people that would be able to do that um, in terms of digitization efforts as a youth. Um, and one such example of what we're doing now, uh, which is a pilot project to then guide um, public sector into, into a move to, to adopt this sort of work is seeing how we can outsource uh, digitization of judiciary starting um, initially with transcription of work um, uh, so all your court proceedings will be transcribed by, by youth, not just in Nairobi, but in various parts of, 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 of Kenya um, to ensure that we've got uh, expedient, expedient systems um, uh, and, and matters are dealt with, with quickly. If you've been to a courtroom, there's a lot of handwriting, so it might not necessarily be, uh, transcripts might not be, sorry, the, the written notes might not adequately represent uh, what the court's um, hearing was, um, and so to ensure that we also have a transparency within the courts, uh, this initiative that we decided was important for us to start with. Um, so just in, in, in summary, um, how it, it, it uh, feeds into the digital economy, I think the digital skills and, and the JIRA specifically is very core to, uh, to the digital economy, as uh, Engineer Baum has mentioned. Um, there are a number of pillars, each that require um, our youth to actively participate, whether it's being an entrepreneur or whether it's um, having, you know, a skill as a plumber to, to ensure that you're able to, to compete within your area. Um, digital skills is effectively, um, from how I see it, the foundation of the digital economy. Without that, um, you know, we won't get um, a robust uh, digital economy and, and certainly we'll have um, a lot of uh, youth and members of society that will be left out because they're not able to, to adequately access or benefit from, um, from the, the initiatives that are being um, um, done under the digital economy. All Thank right. You. Great. Thank you very much, Rose. And I know you, you, you'll be jumping off shortly. Um, I, I want to bring in the audience. Um, you can see time is already starting to give us a bit of pressure. I want to bring in the audience um, into the conversation. And uh, Masi Kamara, if you're on the line, um, you have a question for Peter and Jonjo. Please turn on your, your mic is going to be unmuted and you can ask your question directly to Peter. 
Okay, thank you so much for this inspiring uh, webinar. Uh, my name is Masi Kamara, Dr. Masi Kamara. I'm the CEO of Exuvians Kenya. I have a question for Peter. Um, I'm very inspired by what you're doing and it's really wonderful that you're promoting uh, you know, farmers in Kenya and trying to help them sell their, their food online. But what are you doing? My question is, I mean, we are at a time in Kenya where we are really, you know, the cancer is rising, lifestyle diseases are rising in Kenya. And um, COVID has been a clear example that uh, we need to do something about our health and well-being. We need to take care of what you're eating because we are, we are what we eat. So what are you doing to promote um, organic farmers and uh, to ensure that actually they understand the international regulations, international standards, uh, international qualifications that are needed to be able to, give, to be given um, organic farmers certificates and organic farmers labeling. Because, you know, someone like me, I want to eat only organic food, but when I go to Nairobi or when I contact some of the suppliers in Kenya, I'm not 100% sure that I can actually trust the kind of food they're selling me is authentic organic grown food. Thank you so much, uh, Marcy. Um, uh, one of the things that uh, we're, we're doing is that uh, we started a project with IFC. Uh, this was uh, sometime uh, last year. And our objective was around uh, certifying uh, our farmers around uh, Global GAP, which is a global uh, general uh, um, uh, good agricultural practices. The whole idea here is uh, by getting that uh, certification, one is to ensure that, you know, when it comes to, um, for example, you know, record keeping, the types of fertilizers that people use or the pesticides that uh, people use, it gets us to at least uh, meet EU standards within the country as far as uh, minimum residual levels are concerned for food. Now, that ensures at least then we get safe food. And, uh, and by getting the safe food does not necessarily mean uh, organic. So the way I would look at it is that there's two tiers to it. The first tier is around, can we first of all achieve food safety, get traceability, uh, get minimum residual levels uh, in check. Now, organic is a, is a level above that where you're saying that, look, you know, we're not going to use uh, pesticides, we're not going to use uh, uh, maybe uh, uh, synthetic uh, fertilizers and uh, that type of farming is uh, lower yielding than uh, than uh, what I'd call the uh, conventional uh, type of uh, farming. Now what happens is that because of the lower yields the pricing is normally slightly higher, not actually slightly higher, significantly higher because post-harvest losses are higher and all. So what you expect is that for example if you go to the US, uh, if you want to uh, if you want uh, uh, general food that actually meets the minimum residual levels in line with uh, food safety standards, uh, you, can, you can buy that in a normal supermarket. If you want organic produce, then you can also go to a place like Whole Foods where you then pay 30 to 40% higher. And what we want to do is uh, start also tiering because you find that there are some farmers who are willing to uh, grow food from an organic uh, basis. And uh, we'll make that available. But the thing is that it will come at a much, much higher price uh, than uh, what I'd call conventional uh, food. So, so I think these are the two uh, channels that uh, we're looking at. But net, net, uh, we're, we're really, really uh, for safe food. For that, Peter. There's, there's a second, a follow-on question to that around uh, privacy considerations. From, uh, there's a question here by Anthony Gatura. I'll just ask it on his, on his behalf. Um, a question that is asking what, is, what are the privacy considerations you'll be looking at when using technology in the food supply chain? Okay, so well, when I look at uh, privacy, I'm, I'm presuming that this is to do with uh, data privacy. So the thing is that uh, the data that uh, we have, uh, we, uh, we, do not, uh, we do not sell that data onwards uh, to any other parties. What we do is that we use this purely for our planning and uh, for um, essentially provision of services. So what I would say is that uh, as a company, we have a very uh, stringent policy around uh, how we use data. What we, we also have situations where, for example, some of our retailers, because we have a lot of data on, um, on their financial transactions. So in some instances, we're asking those retailers, by the way, do you want to access a financial product? And if you do, are you okay for us to share your data? 
So they actually sign a physical consent form where we then share that data with a financial institution for credit scoring purposes. And that uh, allows them to access credit. But other than that, uh, we, uh, we, we, we respect the provisions of the Data Privacy Act as it is today. Thank you, Peter. Let me bring back Kennedy into the conversation. Kennedy, um, as convenient as they are, um, these digital payments or cashless payments uh, do not come without cost. And uh, the issue of data privacy, of course, cybersecurity risks still remain a concern. Um, these are significant barriers to the penetration of uh, these types of digital payments. What are some of the choices that we need to consider in digital payment space as we look into the future? Thank you, Maxwell. Um, so um, if, 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 if we were to uh, dissect the, the, the payments uh, industry, uh, I think one of the um, key trends that we're seeing is that um, there's a movement away from just being transactional to enabling businesses to do more. Organizations that we've seen that are focused more on building value uh, or probably you know, coming up with value added services and embedding a payment solution as part of that value added service uh, are much more positioned to win in future. Uh, and, so, and therefore, you know, moving away from just uh, transactional to uh, providing value added services is one way to move away from just uh, uh, competing on price alone. Um, and then the second thing is um, the, the, the convenience, right? Building convenience for consumers as well as merchants. Um, by merchants, in this case, I'm referring to businesses. How convenient is your solution? I think uh, it was Engineer Bam who mentioned something about interoperability. There's a lot of fragmentation out there. Um, there are a lot of payment solutions out there. And those solutions, while they may provide some level of convenience to the consumer, they are making it a little bit more difficult for the merchant or the business to be able to operate more efficiently. They are adding to uh, operational costs um, of you know, doing reconciliations, the back office um, processes. And therefore, um, any payment solution out there that um, has been rolled out, the first thing to consider is interoperability. How do you interoperate? How do you make it as efficient as possible for the business to be able to, uh, to operate more efficiently? Um, I think just to piggyback on that, <clears throat> if you're looking at it from a, from a business perspective, it is very important to go beyond interoperability and think about integration as well. How do you integrate your payment solution to existing value-added services so that a merchant does not have to, you know, um, do reconciliations on a system by system basis. It's a single source, a single point where they're able to access all the information that they need. They're able to, um, uh, to analyze their business in, uh, within a single source. I think as we move into the future, three key um, aspects emerge. Convergence of payments, interoperability, and integration at merchant points. Second, um, there's the trust equation is changing. Um, as, 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 as the panelists and even the, um, the audience will agree with me, trust is at the center of any payment solution. And so it's very important to start thinking about how do we protect consumer data? I know my fellow panelists have talked about, talked about how do we make sure that consumer data is protected? Um, how do you make sure that consumers are not being defrauded? How do you make sure that consumers um, uh, can be able to trust the solution that you're, uh, that you're rolling out if it's a payment solution? From a visa perspective, uh, we employ um, various technologies to make sure that this happens. First, uh, for example, in the rollout of contactless uh, solutions, which is something that we're preparing to do uh, in Kenya, instead of inserting your card, you'll be able to tap and to, to complete a payment. And we will be introducing um, uh, new aspects of that uh, tapping where for certain amounts, you will not be required as a consumer to, um, uh, to authenticate yourself. But then how do you make it as secure as possible for the consumer to be able to trust that 
I can tap without having to enter my PIN or to be able to authenticate myself. But then, you know, um, my, my information cannot be stolen or my card cannot be um, uh, replicated and, and be used by a fraudster. So using data analytics from our perspective, getting to understand what are the current trends that are happening across um, the world and making sure that we are integrating that information into what is happening, for example, in Kenya as we speak, um, and, and, and deciding how much of uh, a consumer's money can, can we enable to transact without having to authentic, authenticate yourself uh, is very important. Second, um, we rolled out a visa secure program for our merchants, uh, especially the merchants who are migrating online. And the, that program is basically um, um, supposed to guide our uh, partners, uh, especially bank partners, to be able to um, adhere to certain guidelines when they are enabling a, cons uh, a merchant to be able to trade online and to build the right experiences for the consumer um, while they are online. The third thing that we've done is uh, tokenization. And I think this is something that um, it's futuristic, but it's already here, right? When we talk about, for example, uh, I'll give a practical example. If you're, you go on Netflix and you, you, you save your card details there, what the consumer does not know is that Netflix does, uh, does not have access to your, your card information. When you're saving it on the Netflix uh, platform, what happens in the back end is that it's actually being saved with a visa system behind Netflix. So Netflix does not have any access to your, uh, to your card data. Instead, what we provision with Netflix is what we call a token, which is uh, like a pseudo um, a, a card number that is useless in case for example, if you know, in, in the unlikely event that Netflix uh, systems are compromised. And so the consumer is able to, uh, to transact online and, and consume services like Netflix and, and, and other local services as well without having to worry about uh, exposure of their card details uh, online. So to us, I, uh, we take uh, security very seriously and we do actually um, uh, invest in making sure that uh, consumer data is protected. And that is, I think, one of the key trends that is going to happen uh, in the very near future. Second is, uh, or maybe the last, the last point that I wanted to make is uh, the experiences that we're seeing online, and especially in the, in the COVID scenario, where you know, there's, there's more transition of trade that is happening online that has been enabled by the, by the COVID situation, uh, for better or worse. But um, you know, the experience on online is not the most optimal experience because whenever you move from one merchant to the next, you're actually asked to enter your card details, even if that merchant is enabling for you to enter your card details only once. But it is one merchant, the next merchant, and the next merchant, and the next merchant. It's not the most ideal scenario. So uh, what, we are, um, what we are working on is to um, harmonize that experience for the consumer so that whenever a consumer goes online and they want to do a transaction, think about a scenario where you go online, you interact with one merchant and you enter your card details and those card details can be replicated across multiple merchants that you will be able to access. Secure remote commerce is what we're calling it. It's a it's a unique way of transacting that then enables the consumer to be able to, uh, to, to, be, to be first protected, but more importantly, to improve the experience of the consumer online. Um, but um, to the merchant also, uh, what, what we think is going to be very important as far as this solution is concerned, is that uh, you know, what we see as trends of cut abandonment, uh, when a consumer goes online and they you know, they're, they're trying to, to trade. And when they get to the point where they're able to, to enter their card details, something happens and the consumer drops off. With a secure remote commerce, you will be able to, you know, to, to make it as seamless as possible for the merchant as well as for the consumer. So the experience is both on the, on the merchant who's trying to trade online and the, and the consumer who's trying to access goods and services online. Okay, all right, fantastic. Thank you, thank you, Kennedy. 
Um, I can see Engineer Obam and uh, Peter have been very busy answering your questions on the, on the Q&A tab um, <laughs> on the side, which is great. Um, I think we can take one more question before we close, and then this is directed at Peter. Um, Peter, I, I know there are several uh, you know, people on the call um, who really admire what you've been able to achieve at, at, at Trigger. Um, and, and I'm sure that uh, you know, a lot of our local digital startups are really struggling with the issue of funding. It, it seems to be a key barrier when it comes to um, you know, just getting ourselves, uh, our digital startups off the blocks. Um, Twigger seems to have done well in this regard, um, at least from what you can see and what we, 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 we read uh, in the press. Um, are there some pointers or insights that you can share um, you know, from your experience on how um, you know, startups can approach this and how uh, you know, um, they can you know, do well when it comes to this issue of uh, raising funds? No, thank you so much, uh, Maxwell. I think uh, one of the things that uh, I would say in the market is uh, there is a uh, there is a significant amount of capital uh, in the market uh, looking for a home. Unfortunately, most of this capital to be deployed is uh, above a million dollars. So, so what's happening is that a lot of companies are not able to get to a point where they can access the capital that uh, exists in the market. And what happens in this uh, uh, economy is that, uh, or in this market is that, in this early stage funding, we really don't have uh, a developed ecosystem that actually supports that. And that's where the big challenge is. In the case of Trigger, we were fortunate enough because I was able to finance the business uh, in, the, in the early days to a point where we could qualify for uh, some of that uh, funding. But what you find is that, you know, right now, a lot of uh, entrepreneurs right now are not able to raise 10 million, 20 million, 30 million uh, during this period. And one of the things that, uh, uh, we're working on uh, as uh, trying to work with uh, existing ecosystem players is how do we then create a pool of resources that's able to fund this missing middle? How do you then get somebody with an idea who wants to start and get him to access maybe a uh, capital of maybe 10 million? But not just that, it's also getting that person the right type of mentorship to ensure that uh, they're thinking about the business in the right way. They're putting in the right level of governance. You know, they're, they're putting in together structures that ensure that by the time they're getting to a point where they're sitting in front of an international investor, they are actually uh, investable, if I, may use, uh, if I may use that word. So there's a lot that we need to do in that space. And I think uh, I'm starting to see a coming together of uh, different parties uh, in terms of uh, trying to figure out how we can then create an ecosystem that addresses uh, this, particular, uh, this particular need. And if we unlock that, I think then it allows the country to then uh, access uh, much uh, greater capital. Because right now, when you're starting up your business, banks are not the type of uh, uh, partners uh, who, are, who are looking at... Uh, um, who are actually looking at uh, investing in, uh, in, in young companies because banks are risk averse and uh, young companies uh, at this point are deemed to be risky. So you need a way to allow them access risky capital to achieve whatever it is that they need to achieve and, ac and access less risky capital as they move along. So my, my, um, my advice is, uh, you know what, it's something that uh, I'm working on. I'm very, very committed to this and I'm hoping that uh, we can create that ecosystem to support startups in the country. Okay, fantastic, thank you. Uh, I'll give Engineer Obam and uh, Kennedy a minute each to just uh, their final uh, closing comments as, as we wind up. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Maxwell. Uh, uh, for me, my, the comment I would like to close with is that uh, uh, since I was talking about policies and strategies, uh, the, the policies that we started making 15 years ago that brought in submarine cables that brought liberalization of the sector, competition in the sector, allowing mobile money. I think this what has allowed us to be able to sustain the, the digital economy, especially during this uh, challenging time of uh, pandemic. We, the networks have been resilient. I think we've been able to do these uh, kinds of meetings without uh, uh, any additional, uh, you know, uh, uh, strengthening of the network. So I think the policies that we made and the investments that were, were made by the 
by the mobile operators in the networks and even the infrastructure providers have worked. And uh, going forward, I think some of the initiatives that I talked about are geared towards building on those, uh, th th those initial steps to make sure that we have a robust uh, economy. The second point would be that uh, things are not going to be the same. Uh, I think we are going to see a lot, a more rapid transformation of our economy to the digital platforms. Uh, yeah. And uh, the, the, even if we finish COVID-19 in, six, in, in six, six months' time, I think uh, this has changed. The playing field has been changed forever, and we should be prepared to do more things and develop more things uh, geared towards the, uh, the, the digital platforms. That was, those would be my closing remarks. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Engineer Obama. Kennedy? All right, so um, I'll, I'll, I'll keep it uh, short. Uh, and simple because of uh, because of time. Um, yes, the COVID nineteen situation has uh, accelerated somewhat uh, the transformation that uh, we have been working very hard to to, to make sure that we achieve uh, over the last uh, decades, the last few decades. Uh, we're talking about um, you know the transformation just from you know handling cash to going digital. Um, and you know, digital can be any format. It could be mobile money. It could be card. As long as it's not, you know, the hard cash, um, and, uh, I think it has a lot of uh, opportunity uh, to 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 grow the economy of Kenya specifically. Now, when we talk about um, that digitization of of, of cash, I, I think um, the situation that is happening today, like I mentioned, is actually an acceleration. Yes. But it shouldn't be, um, you know, it shouldn't be just a case of uh, we, are, you know, okay, it has happened. It's now a natural, you know, turn of events, and we believe that it's going to be sustainable. I don't think it will be sustainable unless we do some things differently, and that means making sure that uh, businesses are enabled to accept digital payments first and foremost. Making sure that consumers are enabled with, with digital payment solutions. Uh, we've done well in, in countries like Kenya to make sure that as, as many consumers as possible uh, carry a card. Uh, mobile money solutions have done well to make sure that consumers have access to some form of a digital solution. But I think what is also important is as we continue to address the consumers who have not been addressed, we have to make sure that the merchants or the businesses that are accepting payments are also encouraged to, uh, to accept payments as much as possible. Uh, because that's the transition that, you know, that is the next level of the transition. I think on the consumer side, there's a lot of work that has, has gone in. The transition is really on the businesses side, um, you know, beyond, for example, a city like Nairobi. Um, the moment you step out, out of Nairobi, then you realize that cash is still uh, very much king. In Nairobi, you may have some choices. Cash is still king in Nairobi, but you do have um, a, a choice on how you want to pay. But beyond Nairobi, then we need to start building those uh, uh, those choices for the consumers. Excellent. Thank you, Kennedy. Peter, your closing remarks. No, I think uh, I, I think definitely we're living in a very very interesting time, and uh, and I think uh, as uh, we start finding more and more use cases of how technology can make people's lives easier, remove the friction to commerce, uh, then we're going to see uh, wide scale uh, adoption. So. Um, uh, very, very excited about the times that we live in right now. Okay, fantastic. Indeed, exciting times for, for everybody, for us. And uh, I think as we come to a close, I just want to invite everybody to uh, take a quick poll that's coming up on your screen right now. It will only take you three seconds, actually. Two questions, just uh, put in your submission. Um, and as you do that, I, I want to really, really thank our panelists uh, this morning who've been great and uh, we've had a very engaging and a very insightful uh, conversation. Thank you, Engineer Obam. Thank you, Peter Njonjo. Thank you, Kennedy Luhombo and uh, Rose, um, who had to drop off for another meeting. We really appreciate your time. We appreciate the insights that you've shared. And I want to thank everybody um, for attending uh, today's uh, webinar and participating. And please look out for uh, the recording of today's webinar. Um, which will be made available to you in a subsequent communication from us. And uh, with that, I want to bring our webinar to the end. Again, thanks once more. I wish you a wonderful weekend and please stay safe. Thank you. <laughs>